Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory. Kelly's back with us today. Got some more good word for us. You don't want to miss it. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you, Mama. Jesus has made us free. I'm not yes, talking about, I'm not wanting you to develop a sin consciousness. But I'm one, you know, the word says, you know, you compare yourselves to each other and that's not our comparison mode. I could compare myself, not to you, because you're so great, but oh. I might find somebody. You know, you don't try to compare yourself to people to, that are more awesome than you, but sometimes Satan would love that, and then you feel less than, and he's good with that. And then if you compare yourself to somebody that you feel better than, then you're, That's not good either. you feel more <laughs> than. So you're working in pride or shame, one of the two. He doesn't care. They're both a lie because our comparison should not be among right. each other. Our comparison should be with the spirit of the living God. Jesus himself came into our heart to change what we look like, change what we act like, change what we sound like. Amen. And Satan doesn't even care if change we- Change what we are like. Are like, exactly, from the inside out. Of course, Satan loves it too when we get caught up in performance or caught up in striving to be this or striving to be that because he knows as long as we're striving in our flesh to be awesome in him, in Jesus, we're not going to be able to do it. If we become one with Jesus, if we allow him not into our, I mean, he's, if we're born again, he's filled up our spirit. But it's our soul, our mind and our will and our emotion. Our soul has so much to do with our life. Oh, yeah. The word says, beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper even as your soul prospers. There is not going to be any prosperous until your soul prospers. Because having money is not being prosperous. I mean, people say y'all are just a prosperity ministry. Absolutely. And we're not talking about just having, you know, having money it's awesome and it's fabulous and it helps. It does but come in handy. It comes in handy, especially if you need to preach the gospel or help people or do things for people. And it's something that Jesus provided for us. But we're not prosperous by having money. We're prosperous by having Jesus on the inside, Amen. living on the inside of us, coming That's out. Right with the love of God, when relationships prosper, when life prospers, when your heart prospers, when your heart's not condemning you. What does it mean for your heart to condemn you? When your heart's not telling you everybody hates you, when your heart's not telling you you're no good or you should be ashamed of yourself or you're better than everybody else, whatever that message of the enemy that is a lie, that your heart is consistently Filtering your life through, you could look at it like that. Like someone who's faced, who's got abandonment harboring in their heart, that's a lie that the enemy put in there. You're abandoned, you have no father. Well, A, regardless of your life with on the earth, you have a father who loves you and yes. he literally emptied heaven to get you back. He sent Jesus to win you back. There's not one person that I'm talking to that does not have a father who loves them. Now you have to receive it. You have to receive the love. You have to receive Jesus. But the Bible tells us, you know, if we show we belong to Jesus, and then he talks about, you know, by our love and, and by, the, by the way we stop sinning, we show we belong to Jesus. Those are not the ways we belong to Jesus, but it shows we belong to Jesus. How do we really belong to Jesus? He says, if you keep sinning or if you hate your brother, you say, you're, you say you love God, but you hate your brother, that shows you really don't belong to Jesus. What does he mean? Does he mean you're not a Christian? Does he mean you're not going to heaven? No. What he means is there's a space in you that doesn't fully belong to Jesus because you're harboring something else. And so that's when I say sin, and I'm talking about removing sin out of our heart. I'm talking about the root of sin. I'm not talking about that thing you did. That thing you did that you repented for, that thing came from a root on the inside of you. The Bible says out of a good treasure of a good man's heart, there comes good fruit. What comes out of our mouth is not the beginning of of what we have. It's what's on the inside, really, 
is the beginning of what our life looks like. Now, what comes out of our mouth shows what's in the inside. And we yeah. can purposely take God's word and make it come out of our mouth and it will then change what's in the inside. So God gave us that ability to change the tree on the inside with the words of our mouth when they are his words. He's given us words here to speak. He'll give us words in our heart that have to do with your life. Like I told the story yesterday of calling somebody to apologize for a certain thing that Jesus said, you need to do that. I didn't like it. I didn't want to, but I allowed the words he told me to come out of my mouth and they changed a big situation for me because he knew, but really mostly it changed me. Hmm. And when you can allow him to change you, you, it is less important to you what everybody else does. You know, when you're a victim, everybody else can control you. One day, this is an example of what I'm talking about. One day I was, I don't even remember what had happened now, but boy, somebody lit my fire. Somebody oh. offended me. And uh, I was feeling like um, they were against me. And I was feeling like they're affecting my ability to do X, Y, Z. And the, it was just so quiet on the inside of me. The Lord just spoke up and he said, Kelly, you're being a victim. And I had already determined in my life, I will be no victim. I am not a victim. I'm a victor. And you can't be a victim and a victor at the same time. So what I'm bringing to you this week and next is just the, I, the thought and the understanding that there's stuff we need to deal with. Repenting of the thing you did, the lie you told, the cat you kicked, the whatever it is, the thing you stole, the way you didn't walk in love or you were angry or bitter or whatever. Repenting of that occasion and event is not the cleansing of it. But when you repent from that thing you did, you open the door for him, Jesus to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So that's what I want us to see today. And I want us to really kind of get off of our high horse a little bit. I had to, and so I'm just going to assume you do too. So if I had to, you do too. Uh, get in, a, in my thinking that there, I do need to deal with the root of sin that's trying to take a home in my life, make a home and speak to me when it wants to in my soul. And then we went to Mark 11 earlier in the week where Jesus drove out the lie. He said, my father's temple is a house of prayer for all nations and you've made it a den of thieves. Well, our body, our life is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's the temple of God, the temple of Jesus in this earth. We need to give him a good place to live. And we need, if you let him, he'll do the housekeeping for you. You just have to say the words and get it out and give him permission to point things out to you. We talked about Revelation 3. He wants to sit down with us and tell us the stuff that we need to remove and clean us up. So, and, and today's the day for it. Now is the time he's cleaning his church out. You know, I said the other day, I started to say this, but I don't think I finished it, but uh, he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And to me, looking in, looking at myself and looking at the church, we've got a ways to go before somebody would, before the world would describe us as a church without spot or wrinkle. Because John 17 says, that when we get so unified as a body that the world is going to know how much Jesus loves them. They're going to see Jesus when we come together. Well, we're not there. They're not looking at us and going, oh, convinced of their sins and give me Jesus because the whole body of Christ looks like Jesus. But we're going there. But I was thinking the other day that the, a church without spot or wrinkle requires the same thing your cotton shirt does. Some heat, some water, some steam, and a little pressure to get the wrinkles out. Well, that's what he's doing right now. He's got fire burning on the inside of us, burning stuff out of us that doesn't belong, changing our lives right now more than ever before. Heat, fire of the Holy Spirit, 
and the presence of Jesus and the washing of the water of the word and some pressure on us to do it, to let Jesus in and to open up our heart and let him come in and push stuff out. So <laughs> we're becoming that church. I believe it's going to happen quickly. So we left off yesterday just talking about John lived with Jesus and he wrote this book, he said, so that you and I can now share in the life that they led with him. They saw him. They gazed at his face. They could see his eyes when he's talking to them. They were experiencing the love, the correction. Just ask Peter. Jesus was correcting him. Why? Because he thought he was a loser? No, but because Jesus wanted a home in Peter so Peter could end up doing what he ended up doing. Jesus wanted to have a home in there, not filled with the lies of it, that Peter was always walking in the flesh because of the untruths that were harbored in his heart. Jesus even called him, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He said, you don't have your mind set on what the father wants. Peter wanted his own way and we can all be that way. So let's look here. He says, um, talking about Jesus, uh, actually from about verse five on, first John is talking about sin. Here we are, the most mature apostle in the faith and he's talking about sin and he's talking about the end days and he's talking to the believer, but he's talking about sin and you know, in Revelation 3, we, we read it this week, Jesus was talking to the church and he's talking about, I'm having to knock. Why is he having to knock on the door of a heart that should belong to him? Why is he having to knock on the door of a heart that he lives in? I had him talk to me about that. Um, let me just read it. He said, um, the, talking about the door, to unlock or remove. This is just what he said to me. So that wasn't really a total thought, but he's um, talking about unlocking the door or even removing the door. He said, it's not locked, but everyone has to open the door themselves. You have to remove the door out of the way before Jesus can come into your soul and clean it up the way he's talking about. All that the father wanted for you is on the other side of me. He's, talking, he's on the other side of that door. That's why I said, seek first the kingdom of God. That's why I said, come in, to come in faith, you must believe that I am. For us to come to him in faith, to believe him for any of these outer things, we have to believe that Jesus is the provider and everything that we need. You know, I was, this song was stuck in my head, this worship song the last few days. It's um, Kim Walker Smith singing, I need you more. I need you more than yesterday. I need you more than the song I sing, than the air I breathe. I need you more. I need you more. And I was thinking about that song and that word need, it's not a, it doesn't mean a word This in this, the way we're talking about needing Jesus. It's not a matter of lack. It's a matter of requirement. I don't lack air, but I need it. I require oxygen to live. I don't lack oxygen. You don't see me here gagging for breath. I have it, but I require it. So when we say, I need Jesus more. I need him more today than I did yesterday. I need him more tomorrow than I do today. Why? I require him. I require him to live not just silently in my heart because I'm a Christian. I require him to talk to me all the time. He required the father to tell him every word and every action to do and say, and I'm telling you, I am pressing to be so full of him. Yes, amen. I require that now. I never used to think about that. I thought, oh, I have a Jesus. I didn't think about the requirement for him to be my everything. I thought he already was, but when he began clearing me out, I began to see I had places in my heart that were harboring some untruths and he wasn't living in that place. He was knocking to get into that space. Mm. He said, um, those who diligently seek me have the veil removed and they'll find me. That's what second Corinthians um, four says. He says, look into my eyes and see yourself. 
um, the veil is taken away, not only from your seeing me, but the veil between you and I. I have to search for lost sheep because they have shut the door. Now, lost sheep are ones that used to be his. He goes out and gets them. This is the only closed door between you and the Father. He said, I'm the door and not another. So we're not going to get to this by any other means. We're not going to get this door out of the way by all of our good works. We're going to get this door out of the way by just opening it. That's a whole lot easier than oh, having yeah. to drive out yourself all the stuff that might be in you. All you have to do is say, I open the door of my heart right now, Jesus. Please come in and start the cleansing process. So anyway, back to verse John. It says, um, God is pure light. You will never find, I'm reading out of the New Living, by the way. I mean, the, this is the Passion, but a combination of the New Living and the Passion. What verse are you on? This is uh, verse five, and this is in the Passion. You will never find even a trace of darkness in Him. If we claim that we share life with Him, but we keep walking in the realm of darkness, we're fooling ourselves and we're not living the truth. Let me read that in the New Living. It says, um, that's verse six. We are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. What is it saying? The is that the? This is just King that's James. That's the King James. What does mm -hmm. that say in verse six? If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. It says if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. See, the ways we don't live with fellowship with Jesus and the sin we allow to live in our heart comes between me and you, comes between mm -hmm. you and other people. And it says, um, if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, since his son, cleanses us from all sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses. We have been made free. He's already done it. We are we free, are. but now it's time to receive that and be free. We've been made free, but it's time to be free. Amen. And as we allow him to come in, as we repent, shorten this, we're going to pick up here, but I'm just going to read... Um, Verse eight and nine, if we claim we have no sin, we're just fooling ourselves. If we claim there's nothing in there that's of sin, of the enemy, a lie of the enemy, we're fooling ourselves. But if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us yes, of our sin you. and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this week we're going to talk about how he can cleanse us from the unright places that are in our heart the lies that the enemy has tried to plant in our heart, we're going to get free of them. Praise uh, God. You know, in the rest of these broadcasts, we're going to pick it up in our next broadcast. Kelly and I'll be right back. We hope you enjoyed today's teaching from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And remember, Jesus is Lord.